Hi folks, welcome, welcome. I'm Josh, I'm gonna do some art. I'm gonna paint on some rocks. Real rocks, you ask? Nay, I tell you, nine, not real rocks. Look at these rocks that I made from scratch. And they're like, they're like these fun spongy rocks. Isn't that fun? You could throw these at your friends. Probably can't put an eye out with them. That's what makes them special. Uh, no eyes will be removed in the uh, making of this. So these have, uh, the only thing I've done on them is put a wash on them. And it was funny because they are so spongy. These are made with a product called Foam It. So I sculpted the original. Um, here's the original out of uh, Freeform Air. Made a mold out of that and then filled it with the spongy stuff. And so I soaked a wash into it and then I like squeezed uh, with paper towels on each side. And that gave me a pretty good base to work off of. Um, so I'm pretty excited about that. Although, um, <clears throat> what if you throw these stones towards birds? They'll probably, the, the birds will probably be afraid and not like you anymore. I mean, our birds, even the ones that are used to us feeding them, when we throw nuts towards them they still run away like we're attacking them so you know how it is uh it is what it is let me i wanted to close the loop on something um i, I think yeah yeah last week we were um <laughs> actually making the mold that I was just referring to. Hold on one second. Uh, okay. And I, I had this problem where the gasket was leaking. So I just wanted to uh, show you where we're at on that whole thing. So that part right there that's where we put our container of um, stuff in. Let's not be blurry. And uh, when I used the vacuum pump, uh, it got a certain amount of vacuum in there and then started leaking. And so this is my solution in theory. <laughs> we're about to, to do an unboxing, as it were. Get some more light here. So basically, what I did was last night, I poured rubber around the edges of my lid. Now my lid is a clear uh, plexiglass, the point being so that you could look through and see uh, the rubber to see if it's doing what it needs to do. Ah. Music's being too loud. Okay, so uh, in order to replace this piece of garbage, so this is a like a something you put on windows or doors, like weather stripping, and it's flexible and it works fine on the pot as long as it is like perfectly on there. But it was impossible to get it perfectly on there and kept on sticking. So now we're onto this. And I'm just dying to see if it's going to work.
Now, because this is plexiglass, it means that the this rubber doesn't stick to it. This rubber sticks to almost nothing. Uh, but so what I had to do was make it so that the rubber could go all the way around the side and seep under the other side of it. So it's kind of like a glove over the edges of the lid. Uh, this paper is not sticking to the rubber, it's uh, hot glued to the paper under it. Okay, and then this clay here was basically put there to dam the rubber so it wouldn't seep over the entire surface because I need to have that clear window to be able to peer into the pot while it's vacuuming. As expected, see that's not really sticking to it very well. Um, well, it's not sticking to it at all. But the hope is that because it's encased on both sides, it can't be like suctioned into <laughs> the pot, uh, which was what was happening to the previous seal. there was a little bit of a leak where it started dripping through here. I don't think that's going to be a problem.
So the the concern was that as it was pulling that off, it would actually like tear the rubber, bring it with it, but it didn't seem to do that. So that's great. only reason I care about this flashing is I just don't want any of it to um, interrupt where the lid touches the flat surface here like there because that would create a little area for um, air to be sucked in look like it's going anywhere I'm not gonna do an actual vacuum test at this point because I'd have to open the garage and plug everything in and blah 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 but anyway just thought you'd like to see that and I wanted to show you what the result of using uh, non or not very well uh, degassed rubber gets you so here's the mold from the rubber that I made in there last week and um, let's see if we can get a good close-up on this. So here's a pretty solid example. There's like a... You see that bubble there? Pretty much on every single little tip. Anywhere that bubbles could <laughs> kind of get caught on the mold, they totally did which sucks because this is like, I don't know, $75 worth of rubber uh, that made molds that are now not great. <laughs> just just played not great. Um, but that's part of the R&D process that I'm going through right now. Um, 
And then when I cast these out of that mold, um, all of those little bubbles that you see would turn into basically little pimples on the surface. So here's an example of that. Right here, you see that little guy? Now, on bumpy rocks, often it's not terribly noticeable. Um, but also this foam, it just did a root, like there's these huge uh, cavities from where it did not fill up the mold, even though it poured out of the mold, you know, like double the volume because you put it in and then it starts expanding. Um, but yeah, in this case, it just was like, nope, not going to do a good job for you. So it's both like imperfect on a, <laughs> but it's got bubbles in the mold and bubbles in the cast, but it's perfectly fine for, you know, testing purposes at this point. Um, and the, the other neat thing is that, let's see if I can remember how to do this. I'm, I've been getting better at it, but I'm obviously not quite, okay, there we go. Uh, the way these fit together, it's always a brain teaser to me. Oh, there we go. So yeah, that's kind of a fun thing, especially as they're squishy, like you could imagine, you could wrap these around any any shape you want, right? So you could make a cliff wall out of a pile of garbage and then just like glue these on and it would look like probably super good. We'll, we'll be doing testing and find out if that's the case. Okay, so the main bulk of what I wanted to spend time on today was kind of figuring out best practices for uh, quickly painting. I usually spend way too much time getting caught up on itty bitty details on everything. And I want to um, figure out how to do textures like this um, quickly. This one, especially. So this is supposed to be, and I finally got some reference for it. I need to get some better reference, but it's essentially that, right? Uh, uncut rocks with generous helping of um, mortar between them. And so the question is, can I paint this in a way that it doesn't involve going in with fine brush and like outlining everything right that would be ridiculous although that's exactly what i did last time so i'm going to see if i can figure out a way to not do that this time oh also hello where am i a few spots a bit of dry brushing and then done yeah yeah if i could get away with that that would be great Let's see if I can get away with that. Um, one of the things that I, is in my reference. Uh, da, 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 da. There we go. Okay. So in my reference, take a note of like the various colors that are in there and how, you know, my tendency is to make each rock kind of a different tone, but most of these rocks have multiple colors in them. Like, Look at that one, right? It's got gray and brown primarily in there. Uh, wow, zooming in on the screen is not great. That one's got like rust and black and a little bit of white, uh, etc. You get the idea. So it feels like I should be able to do more like blotchy stuff on there, but the problem is like having the same color mortar is great. I would like to keep that. And if I just went in with a big blotchy brush and just started, you know, dab, dab, dabbing all over these different colors, then it's going to go over the mortar. And so this is going to require maybe a different approach. However, uh, I do have these guys that do not have mortar and, or at least they don't have visible mortar, right? Um, 
I started experimenting with some interesting color schemes like this more jade and and uh, marble. Yes, marble. <laughs> I was going for sort of a yeah, an interesting different take on it. Um, and because these are made out of uh, spray foam insulation as opposed to these, which are like a professional product made for molding, which ended up giving me huge bubbles. These actually ended up working better, um, which is very surprising to me. Uh, but I painted one side and then left and came back the next day and it was all like curled up almost like a bowl. Um, so I did a primer coat on this side and it's still not perfectly like flattened out, but it is a bit. So I think when I paint this one, I'm gonna make sure that I paint both sides um, to see if it ends up avoiding that problem. Um, so since I already have like some colors down on this one, I figure I might as well do some color variations on this and then um, a, a wash. And on this one, I thought it might be interesting since the natural color of this material is this sort of like off-white beige sort of look. I thought, you know, what if I go for more of a sandstone kind of look? What I'll do is I'll mix up a, a wash, a brown wash. In fact, let me do that now. Technically, the mortar would still be visible. Uh, yes, but it would be lots of different colors, unlike my reference, where it's mostly one color. Uh, here we go. So, in preparation, I've got a bottle that's, you know, almost half water. And then I want to do probably up to there with medium. Paint medium, it's basically the stuff that is in paint that is not the pigment. And helps distribute the particles in your paint. Uh, you know, it's the thing that keeps it from just being a powder. Probably easier to pour water into that. You like a sandstone look? Me too. Then I've got this really cheap um, medium. <laughs> what I found is that, so specifically, does this say matte me? Yes matte medium i cannot find cheap <laughs> i can find pouring medium cheap uh, but it's uh, much glossier than i like however for tests i might as well use up the stuff that i don't like as much Okay, so that's about half water and half medium at this point. And then I throw in some acrylic ink. Apparently, I will throw in all of my acrylic ink. Again, might as well. Of course, I do that right after I throw the lid away.
think I have any more brown ink somehow. I guess I must have used it all. I'm gonna double check on, oh, <laughs> how wrong I am. I forgot, I got this big one. It's a different uh, form factor, so I didn't notice it on my shelf. That feels like the right amount. It's usually between five and 10% I try to do. Um, I really wish, if wishes were fishes, I really wish that I had a lighter brown. So I'm just gonna see what happens if I mix in some yellow. the yellow might as well it's always easier to add dark back in if it's not dark enough okay. and then a little bit of flow aid if you don't have this you can just use dish detergent that's what helps it seep into the cracks really well So I'm going to go for gloves. Really interesting. I restarted my camera. Okay. Let me know if sound sync problem is gone. I don't know what this combination of cameras uh, seems to be doing. I <laughs> haven't had that problem until, I don't know, like last year it just started out of the blue. As far as I know, I haven't changed any of my hardware setup, but you know how these things are. They just like to appear out of the blue. Doesn't look at all like explosive baby diarrhea. What are you talking about? It's not bringing me flashbacks from 25 years ago. <laughs> look at lemon gumball. That's a much better comparison. Let's stick with that one. It's like exactly the color of the um, 
design on my shirt. So I don't mind if I spatter it. In fact, my shirt even has spatters. Look at this. Look at this. Oh, here. Look, it's got that exact color and a spatter pattern. So I might as well just like completely spatter this all over myself. Could not have planned it better. This is definitely lighter than I thought it would be, right? But it, it's acting almost like a um, uh, color tint to put over everything. And then I'll make a darker, or I'll just make the wash darker to um, make the cracks pop. I'm wondering, and while I've got this out, would it make sense to just throw a couple other sort of uh, similar colors on there? Why not? Got some tan, got some orange. I'm looking at this reference right here for these kind of like interesting uh, color combos. Oh yeah, right there. This orange is uh, quite bright, but once I do a, a darker um, a wash and then dry brushing and blah blah blah. Um, it's going to be tamped down quite a bit. So, curious. I'm just lightly dab it off of the raised surfaces. Yeah, I get that lighter. Uh, base color from the material. Uh, the thing that I don't like is when the color settles really hard, like in a crack. So I'm just gonna go in with some water while it's still a little bit wet. Scrub it a little bit.
Yeah, it always starts out with the noble intent, doing it very quickly and procedurally, and then almost always devolves into using the tiny brush. But in this case, you know, I'm, I'm scraping little, little places, okay? I haven't quite gone off the deep end yet. At least according to my standards. The Josh Foreman trademark deep end standards. So here's where I could come in with, let's say, actually, let me just try using this wash. I've got this nice dark wash here. It's already got some brown in it, so it should play nicely. Um, find sort of a medium sized brush. then let's say let's just set a number on it maybe that'll help let's say we can do 10 touches of the brush okay so here's one two three four that didn't count because i didn't get to the end okay five Seven, eight, nine, ten. And then bonus free point because this area is a little sparse. Okay. Yeah. I, so in the case of doing the tiling texture, 
you don't want to spread you don't want them to be like super even but you also can't have them be super um like too clumped because then you end up with weird anomalies when you tile them together although because this is the hand painting part of it like if this was like magically reproduced in a replicator with these colors that would be a problem but it's a good point that um because these are being hand painted on there's I don't have to conform to those rules. In, in the sculpting, I needed to be really careful that there was a fairly even distribution of different shapes and orientations, but um, that's not what's going on here. So yeah, good point. I'm still curious if I go in with some of the heavier bodied acrylic. Again, I kind of want to, maybe this is the wrong brush for this, but I want to be able to have rocks that have different colors on it. And, you know, I'm getting that with some of these just from the dabbing and stuff. Um, and maybe that does enough of what I'm looking for. Again, I'm trying to find what what is a way to do this relatively quickly. If I had to do like 50 of these, right, I wouldn't be hung up on <laughs> like getting all the individual tiles exactly perfect. Uh, but I would want to go in and just add little little blops of anomalous coloring here and there, you know. Lil Blops, that's my rap name. Okay, so I think I'll just kind of leave it like that for now. We'll come back to it and see what this is like after it's dried. Uh, fingers crossed it doesn't get all warped and wobbly. Okay, so now let's see if we can apply a similar approach. On this one, I think I'm just gonna do the black wash, although I've already got some color variation on my brush, so I might as well slap that around a bit. Arcane Void. Yeah, I've been, uh, I'm doing R&D to try to come up with a kind of a texture uh, collection and I'm trying to find ways to uh, get it to where it's semi mass producible. <laughs> that's, that's the trick I'm trying to go for.
always the problem with these deep cracks is that if you leave the the wash kind of pooled up in there um, well a you kind of lose all the visual detail of what's down in there and B it's just I don't know it doesn't come off as terribly realistic unless like you've got like water staining all over the place I'm not I'm trying not to get too hung up pedantic about like getting everything perfect but just you know get it to that 90% stage and I kind of like you know I've been working on this side but my fingers are filthy and they're getting you know bits of stains and smudges and stuff on here um, which is great and realistic so um, all right, do I want to, maybe a watered down, um, wash is what I want on this side, because I, I kind of want to keep this sort of light vibe I've got going on. Oh yeah, you know, while I've got this side sort of damp, I'm going to try something. Because I'm, I'm trying to also see, like, how many stages can I combine into one pass? So another thing, oh. I've got to bring alcohol over. So I got a little spritz bottle of alcohol. This brush is just ill-suited for that particular task. Or this paint is too thick. Where's my little toothbrush? There we go. Oh, sorry, I was muttering into your guys' ear. You get slightly different effects if you do alcohol first and then spatter, or spatter and then alcohol. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try. Some like dimmed down orange with my wash to get sort of a dark brown. And that's just a really nice, quick way to get color variation all over the place, right? Uh, 
this is just kind of my default 50% gray. And so I can take the sort of vibrant colors just straight out of the craft paint jar. And sort of tone them down like so. a fun happy accident so getting like a nice well an unwanted blob but then because the alcohol is already on there like pulling and spreading the paint around it's pretty easy to kind of add little uh, little color variations quickly and especially again I'm not I'm trying not to be hung up on trying to make an entire brick a particular color right um, or stone in this case. They're not bricks. Bricks are a particular thing. Kind of makes me wonder, should I just do some finger painting? Once you get too much alcohol on there, then it starts taking in all your, um, your colors and like pulling them into the, the crevices and making the crevices too bright and colorful. Uh, so there's a limit I want to be aware of. I kind of like this technique because it, again, it's pretty darn fast and it's getting me some nice color variation without getting hung up on trying to make sure the edges are exactly the way I want it. Right? goes back to that sort of art maxim that applies in almost every field of art, which is um, use the largest tools <laughs> you have at your disposal uh, as long as possible in the process until you're forced to step down to the next layer. Um, that helps you f to not get caught up on um, like doing a bunch of little details and then stepping back and realizing, oh wait, the proportions are wrong. Now I need to you know, I've wasted all that work. Um, or what more often happens is you step back, you see it's not perfect, and you're like, well, I've already spent so much time making these details, I'm not gonna change it. And so you end up with something that's maybe nicely detailed, but the overall um, thing is, is not particularly strong.
going to say that's enough variation for now. Although, mm -hmm. do I also not? Yeah, I also don't know black. Come on, basics. Nice to have basically white on one side, black on the other, gray in the middle, and then you can mix whatever color you want, or mix those into whatever you want. This one aside, and by set it aside, I mean throw it on the ground. Uh, this one's not quite dry yet, but it's getting close. It's looking like yummy uh, toasty bread. And so far, it's not curling in one direction or another. That's, that's the thing I wanted to watch for. guy so part of our challenge with this particular one is because there's no individualized rocks everything needs to generally kind of blur together and because this needs to be oriented in any particular direction uh, I don't want to put like stains and drips which is uh, really helpful for making realistic looking like cliff walls now once I actually have this stamped out in a material and I'm wrapping it around things, um, in that case, I would be free to put the stains and drips. But for this test, I just kind of need to, um, let's see, maybe I can start with some of this. Just kind of get it 
randomly distributed. Then some of this. And so this is going to kind of create a wet palette for me to work on. does some interesting things to it. Yeah, I think uh, putting the alcohol on when the wash is still all wet all over it is not uh, doing anything helpful because I've got to dab it anyway. Well, we'll see. Okay. Again, I'm just I'm looking for ways to combine processes that I usually wait for it to dry between coats. Uh, but I did end up with some little darker specklies, which makes me wonder if I do more of this, some more alcohol, and this time go in with white. Not on a spatter. Is it this particular paint? Or is it that I just got too much gray mixed into it? Just beat the devil out of it. Now, if I do my wash dabbing. See, I think all the alcohol that I put on there essentially washed most of the wash <laughs> out of the cracks. Um, but I do have some nice, like, um, spattery remnants. Um, I think it's probably more important to get some color variation, though. Let's see if I can... that I dabbed on and in theory uh, modify the wash because all that pigment's going to be pulled by the wash into the cracks or a lot of it this 
still getting little flecks of this orange. I need to not use that orange anymore. Interesting. Um, I don't know if that particular effect is happening because the mixture of the wash and the alcohol and the uh, regular paint. I just dabbed a lot of it away. Um, but yeah, these little things where it's like there's a, a little bit of a like a bright spot and then it fades off. From there I, I, it's hard to see with the glare but yeah I want to see if I can purposely do that a little more often let me grab a let's see I just need like a garbagey brush it's a little bit bigger let's try this Now, before that even dries, do another wash pass. Normally, I would be waiting for everything to dry between all of these passes. But I just want to find out how necessary is that actually? still getting some of those subtle color variations in but it is definitely subtle so if on the last pass that I did I was just a lot more bold with the color I was just like splattering really thick paint on there Although I'm seeing in places where it is really bright, it is um, kind of fighting the the wash effect of getting into the cracks. 
Right, you don't want the bright, saturated colors being in the cracks. Usually. Okay. I think I'm going to let this rest now. Come back and try another thing after this is dry. I don't know why my camera is having such focus issues today. Okay, now on this one, I'm thinking, you know, the, the base color of these rocks is gray, okay? I would have, you know, based everything differently if I didn't want it to be gray. And this, uh, on my palette, this gray is pretty close to, you know, the, the standard gray. So essentially I can take these uh, desaturated versions of the color mixed with this other gray and use that as uh, highlights here and there. But I don't want to paint every rock. However, the problem is now I'm remembering this again for the second time, like a dummy dum. Um, any rocks that are the same color as the mortar causes that problem of like not being able to differentiate between rock and mortar. The, the texture and shape, you know, helps, but if the color is identical, that's going to be a problem. Oh, right, right. Uh, no, it's not identical because I'm going to be... No, I was trying to figure out how do I not have to go in and paint <laughs> the grout everywhere. Okay, now I remember it. And one thought I had was why not dry brush everything or medium brush everything um, and then go in and highlight rocks because it is easier to highlight the rocks than it is to... paint all the lines of the mortar. So essentially I'm dry brushing for the mortar, although it's going to, you know, help with the dimensionality of the rocks as well. But I'm mostly concerned with making sure that that mortar get some dimension to it. I'm 
trying to think. I could do a further lighter dry brushing, but if I add the color variation to the rocks now, then I could do a dry brush over everything, and it would, I think that gives me the effect I want. So. I cannot think of a way to do this without having to go into every rock. because the mortar is probably going to be fairly white based on the dry brushing I give. If I'm making any of these rocks particularly uh, white, I want to make sure that they're uh, not in that range where they can be so close to the mortar that they get confused for the mortar. Uh, I don't want to spend forever painting individual rocks right now. Because again, this is just kind of proof of concept. I need to make sure that I don't need to do any more sculpting to help facilitate uh, fast and easy painting. That's really what I'm trying to determine here before I go through the process of molding and casting this. I've already done this like twice now. 
and decided I needed to do some more tweaks. But it may just be endemic to or intrinsic to this um, kind of material, like rough hewn rocks with a bunch of mortar squished out between them is just going to always be <laughs> a pain in the butt to paint. That may just be the answer. It's not an answer I want, but it might be the reality that we're dealing with. One thing I'm thinking would be helpful is for the rocks that are really pressed deep into the mortar. Uh, if those ones happen to be darker, that will help with the uh, to visually separate them from the mortar. All right. Uh, last thing I wanted to do before we wrap up is look at my squishy rock boys. Squish squash. And do a little more experimenting. So probably I can just use some of my neutral gray here with a not full dry brush, but medium dry brush. <laughs> the nice thing about this is like there's a hard to get hard to <laughs> hard part to get at Just squash and stretch and now I'm gonna be really curious if I alcohol this is there gonna be any weird material problems harder to get that sort of capillary action on a spongy surface. Yeah, because it kind of soaks in a little bit. back to our finger painting method Let's see Let's see where that gets us I could just use like tinted dry brushing. It's a little bit of blue in there.
Yeah, and you can see where I cut the um, the flashing that came out of there. There's definitely a different um, surface because it's got all the little bubbles in it. Um, okay, I'm starting to see some interesting wrinkling happening here, and I'm guessing that's probably because the alcohol is um, having a bad time. Well, the <laughs> The spongy material is having a bad time with the alcohol. So I'm going to try paint without the alcohol and see if that makes any kind of difference. All right, and it looks like it's about time to go uh, visit another cool artist. So let's uh, do that. Uh, in the meantime, my name is Josh. I have a YouTube channel at Josh Foreman. I have all sorts of uh, more tutorials and art and other fun stuff you should please to check out. With that, I will bid you all a fair adieu. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye.